This morning I am in Williamsburg, Virginia, talking with James S. Heller, who is the pre uh, professor of law and director of the Wolf Law Library at William and Mary Law School. And you're also director of the school's uh, summer program abroad in Madrid, I believe, Jim. Yep, starting this year. Starting this year. Well, it sounds like a nice little gig to have in the summer. Uh, Spain will be warm, but it'll uh, be warm. But it'll be warm here in uh, Virginia right. as well, so I guess why not? I also want to mention, by way of introduction, that you are a uh, past president of the American Association of Law Libraries. Yep. Well, sort of to focus now on you as a human being, like I hopefully we all are, uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, that aspect of yourself, you know, what your life is like perhaps not only today, but uh, even when you were younger? Yeah, well, I'm from Detroit, grew up in Detroit. Um, in those days, a uh, crowded neighborhood with lots and lots of kids. Elementary school is a block away, so we played softball in the summer and on the gravel fields, and we played basketball in people's yards with the, you know the backboard on garages. And in the fall and winter, we play street football and street hockey. Watching, you remember those cars with the big fins in 1959 and 60s? Oh, I remember those. We'd have to dodge the Plymouths and Cadillacs and things like that with the big fins, make sure we didn't get impaled in our necks. Um, so, uh, grew up there, went to Michigan, uh, and personally, I got married in. Um, 1985, my wife's a librarian. Uh, we've got two kids, one's 29 and one's 25, and they live out, out west. It's nice to have kids that are no longer dependent on father and mother for everything. We hope that's the case. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's the case now, we hope that continues to be the case. Yeah, yeah. they're a lot more civilized once they get past about 22 than when they seem, yes. seem to be in the adolescent years. <laughs> yeah, right now they're both doing well. That's great. <clears throat> Well, sort of to follow up and complete a picture about you, I, I know you work uh, here at the Law Library and Law School, but surely you have time for hobbies or other passions of various sorts. Do you have any that uh, you'd like to share? Uh, sure. My wife and I, we like to travel. Mm -hmm. We like to hike. Um, we uh, hike around here. We go to the mountains, go to the southwest a lot. Uh, uh, we like music a lot. Going to spend, could spend four days in Nashville next month. In April, I'm going down to the Tampa Bay Blues Festival. I really like blues. So I like, I like music, I like guitar music. I play guitar. Oh, you do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I play guitar. And I uh, just actually just brought, bought a drum kit also. So my basement is a, a, a music cave, if not a man cave. Uh, in law school, I was a, um, me and some other guys were in a law school band. We started that back in 1974 when I was in San Diego. Mm -hmm. And uh, we played around San Diego. We were a house band. We played some other gigs. Played in the Queen Mary once for a wedding. I had to learn feelings. Uh, I sing most of the songs. Mm -hmm. uh, we played once in uh, the Sahara Hotel in Las Vegas. And then the band didn't exist for about 30 years and about seven years ago. Um, I got I contacted all the guys and we they're all out west. Three are in San Diego, one's in Las Vegas, and we got together again for a, an ALS meeting in San Diego, and we played uh, down there, and we play about once a year now. We get together well, about once a year. Sounds like a nice little uh, yeah, passion to have on the side. It's fun for a bunch of old guys. Yeah. yeah. I know, well, sort of now changing the focus back onto you as a uh, law librarian and director of a library. Could we talk about uh, your, your professional life now a little more? Uh, I know you have three degrees. I've already alluded to one being when you were a law student. Could you be more specific and tell us what they are? The yeah, for you. Uh, so I went to University of Michigan and I. Uh, Graduated from there in 71 with a, what I have, social studies majors and a psychology minor and a teaching certificate. Then I taught for a year in Detroit at Central High School and then I um, went to law school in San Diego, University of San Diego, because my goal was, being from Detroit, one of your main goals is to get to a place where it's nice and warm and sunny, so I limited <laughs> my, my law school search to California, so I went to USD. Uh, from 73 to 76 
And after that, I, um, I went to library school in Berkeley. So while I was in law school, I worked in the library as a work-study student. Um, my roommate and I both worked for the same solo practitioner. Uh, guy had his own law firm, so we did work for him, and I did an externship, I guess, at the city attorney's office, and I thought the law library was more fun than the other things. Mm -hmm. So I applied to one library school, I applied to Berkeley, and they wanted me to take the GREs, and I said no. I said, here's my, I said, here I am, This I was taking the bar, I was going to take the California bar, I wasn't, I was finishing law school, I wasn't going to take another test, mm -hmm. I said I already had taken the LSAT, so here's my, here's my credentials. So if they hadn't taken me, I would have just practiced law with my roommate. Who became so you had plan B already. I had, I had plan B because I was taking the bar and, and uh, yeah. I had plan B, but it, it, things worked out well. Well, I sort of think I know how you slipped into our uh, niche of the profession, but did anyone particularly have any role in helping to uh, guide you in that direction? That's a good question. Um, I never had many mentors at work, but I should mention uh, Mike Jacobstein. Uh -huh. When I was, Jacobstein was the, uh, of course, the librarian at Stanford, yeah. and very well respected. He was the president of the association as well. Um, so when I went up to, going up to Berkeley, I contacted him because he was in Stanford. Mm -hmm. And um, well, I don't know if I should tell the story or not. Uh, well, tell it, and if you get second thoughts about it, you can okay. just ask me to clip it not well, including this part. So they so, don't even know what we're thinking about it. So before I before I started library school, and it turned out that Jake, the, 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 the Mr. Jacob Stein taught the legal research course, which I ended up, he sort of got sick while I taught, and I actually substituted for a couple of weeks. But before that time, the first time I met him, I had spoken with him on the phone, mm -hmm. and I had sent him my resume, so he knew I was from Detroit, and he knew I had taught at Central High School, which, which actually he had gone to Central High School. My mother was there at the same time he was, um, and was in the inner city of Detroit, and um, so I spoke with him right before I was visiting him before I went, went up to Berkeley, I'm away and I stopped in Stanford. And I, um, I go to Stanford and, you know, the secretary welcomes me in and I knock on the door and Mr. Jacobstein opens his door and he looks at me <clears throat> and he goes, mm, you know, he spoke, he speaks no, like that. I remember that, that yeah. Like, mm, yeah. Nice to meet you, Jim. And I come on in. And then I sit down and he says, I have to tell you, mm, when I first saw you, I was disappointed. And I'm thinking... Uh -oh. <laughs> zip, you know, what you're am I, in my, now. What, what, what I do wrong, you know, my zipper down or, you know, with my got stains of ketchup on my shirt or something. And I said, so I had this puzzled look. He said, well, I saw you were from Detroit and I saw you taught at Central High School. And then after I talked to you on the phone, I was sure you were black. Oh. And, and I was hoping we'd have another minority librarian in the profession. <laughs> this is what you get. You fail the test of uh, whatever. <laughs> yeah. So, but um, uh, so he was a person I would talk to while I was in library school there, and, and uh, he's actually the person who uh, was at least partially responsible for me going to GW, where mm -hmm. I met you for almost forty years ago. That, that's right. So before we. <clears throat> Focus, begin focusing on your uh, various positions you've held, including the one of uh, Head of Reader Services at UW. Uh, Mike would be, I assume, as much of a mentor as you would count? Uh, or I guess would you put him in that category? Well, it's interesting. Where, <clears throat> wherever I worked, I guess the, the, I never really had someone who mentored me. No. The, 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 I guess Mr. Jacobstein, because I had him as a teacher and, of course, I knew him as a professional the profession. Mm -hmm. And then maybe a Justice Maureen Moore, who of course we both knew very well, the mm -hmm. Justice Department, who was sort of a, a godlike figure among DC law librarians. She certainly was. <clears throat> Not by actually mentoring me, but just the way she handled herself and navigated things and, and became a very 
powerful person inside uh, the, the DOJ, but most places I went, when I went to GW, uh, Hugh Bernard was my boss, and I remember. Yeah. he was an older man who, mm -hmm. for the most part, let me alone. And um, after that, I went to DOJ, and more, you know, Maureen was very, very supportive. Um, well, you were at uh, George Washington, he came in about 1977, I believe. Yep, yep. And uh, as head of radio services, and as you say, that's when you and I got acquainted. I was across town at American, uh, well, not too far away, and uh, we'd get together and met in the various society, uh, uh, law library and society, which is the D.C. chapter yeah. uh, functions. And it was great. And, you know, it's interesting. We, you know, typical of a lot of our colleagues, uh, you and I have known each other since. Uh, 40, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and we still talk to each other. We, do. Like, we still <laughs> like each other. Yeah. In, in those days, as, as you know, Pat, when I came up in 1977, the, the prior generation, they lamented the fact, oh gosh, you had to start out as the head of, you know, a department of reader services. When, we, when I graduated from law school or library school, you know, 20 years ago, I just became a director. But I came up as a head of, you know, it's a big department at GW yeah. with no experience. And nowadays, you know, people work, you know, 5, 10, 15 years before they get administrative positions usually. Yeah. You know, in a way, maybe, Jim, that's not so bad. I mean, if you start off as a director right out of school, you've got a learning curve, but it's very intense and you're on the job. And the downside of learning curves, you may not learn something fast enough. And you well, that's for sure. Error. Some kind of I, I know I made my share of mistakes. Yeah, but even when we came in, you and I came in about the same time into the profession. A lot of the older uh, librarians, and academic directors, as we would call them today, or I guess associate deans, some of them, um, the head librarians uh, were retiring. They had come in around World War II, and uh, I remember part of how I was recruited into the field was the dean at my law school saying, you know, this is something you might want to consider, Pat, because there there is a shortage and jobs are plentiful, uh, good ones for good people. And new law schools were coming up. Very much. It was There was an expansion underway in, in the legal education field as well. And, uh, a lot of things coming together. So you were, uh, were there at GW for a while and then went to Department of Justice? Yes. Yeah, um, well, how, I mentioned uh, uh, Mike Jacobs kind of being somewhat responsible for me going to GW. I don't know, I'll, I'll tell this other story and we'll see whether they want to keep it or not. So, <laughs> well, I think the first one's want to keep her. <clears throat> you allow it. So I was, I was working at, I was, I was, you know, at Berkeley and I, I, while I was there I was a work-study student as well. I worked at the Center for Study of Law Society and I got to know the people at, at Bolt Hall, including mm -hmm. um, Bob Doyle, who was the head oh, of the Oh, yeah. Great guy. Mm -hmm. And they they were looking for a reference librarian, and I was there, and I wanted to stay in California. And Bob said, "Well, I talked to them. I talked to uh, Val Mastecki was the was the director." That's right. He had come out <clears throat> from Harvard originally by way of Buffalo, I think. Yeah. And he yeah. was at Bolt Hall or Berkeley. I yeah. I think they have de-emphasized Bolt Hall now in their name. But... Yeah, that's probably right. So there, the um, while I was in library school, I'd interviewed in different places, um, and. Berkeley offered me a job to be a reference librarian, and uh, so I said, "This is great. I'm going to get to stay out and get to work for a great law school and get to work with Bob." Um, and I went back to Detroit. Uh, I guess it was after I finished library school early. I did it in, in three semesters instead of four. Went back to Detroit for a few weeks and then drove back to California. And I remember walking into. Berkeley, uh, the law school, and the first thing, so I was supposed to start work the next Monday, and I talked to Bob like a week before because I didn't have a contract. Oh. I talked to him a couple times, you have a contract, Bob, and well, everything's <laughs> fine, don't worry about it, everything's fine. While I was in Detroit, I got a letter. I guess I must have been using my parents' addresses, my, my home address as, uh, as a permanent address. And I got a letter from GW offering me a job as head of reader services. Uh -huh. And I totally forgot they even applied for a job there because I never interviewed there. So I probably sent this a letter to them, you know, last 
you know, November, October, December, some of that department, yeah. probably six or seven months earlier, I had a job offered me, uh, an off a letter from Huber and I'd offered me a job at GW as head of reader services. And I still didn't have a written contract from Bolt from Berkeley. So um, a little nervous about not getting a paycheck. Huh? I was a little <laughs> nervous, so I asked Mr. I asked Mr. Bernard. I, I call. I called him up on the phone. I said, "Can you give me two weeks to think about it?" Because I'd never been there. Yeah. And he said, "Sure." So I drive back to Berkeley. So and so, you know, another week or two had passed. I drive back to Berkeley, and the first thing Bob says to me on that Friday morning, I remember getting back. I drove and went to my apartment. Got went, met him at nine o'clock in the morning and. At the library, and Bob says, um, "Let's go have a cup of coffee." And I'm thinking, something's not right. What's going on here? Mm -hmm. So we go have a cup of coffee, and Bob says that um, <clears throat> we got a little problem here. We're still we're going to hire you, but we can't do it right now. There was a someone who was working, who had been a law librarian, who was working in the general counsel's office then at Berkeley was interested in the job, and she found out that they were hiring me without doing a real search. Oh. So she was, um, she had filed an EO complaint or something within the university, something about that. Sure. I don't know if it was a formal EO complaint, but it was a complaint. So they were going to reopen the search, and in all likelihood, I'd still be hired. Uh, and I was like, oh my God, what do I do now? this going on, it would take at least a month or so. And I had, you know, this job offer from GW in my pocket. Whatever was remaining of the two weeks. <laughs> yeah. So I called Mr. Uh, I called Mr. Jacob Stein up. And I said, I told him what's going on. And uh, I don't know if we can repeat this for the camera. Do you, you censor words, swear four letter words here? I haven't yet, but I he's, suppose I could. He, uh, Mr. Jacob Stein, who was a very distinguished guy, right? Uh -huh. you know, he's about, at that time, about 60 years old, and I'm a 27-year-old kid. And uh, he says, Berkeley's blanked. Go to GW. And I, I went and called GW up and accepted the job there, and I went and talked to Bob, and actually I, I got a, a small settlement for, for my having to tra transfer cross country. So that's how I ended up with you guys So in that's how I ended up in D.C. That's how I ended up in D.C. So, well, so the, the big lesson is sometimes a lot of things fall apart and then they end up working, up well, working well for you. That happened a number of times. That's how I ended up leaving GW for justice. Yeah. Going to another transition. It's another story. Mm -hmm. So I was at GW and I was, um, you know, the, sort of the hot shot young guy, right? And built a nice department. <laughs> Doing stuff there. You know. We both used to be a hot. Ah, yeah, we young were, guys. Young guys. <laughs> so one day, Mr. Bernard calls me up into his office, and he says, um, "Mr. Heller, you're." And I've been there what two and a half years, uh -huh. a little more than two years. It was uh, in November, I think it was. Yeah, it was in November. Mr. Heller, your future at GW hangs by a thread. Uh oh. Excuse me. Your future at GW hangs by a thread. I said, I have no idea what, why. He said, well, I got a call from one of the faculty members. They had some crazy faculty members there. They I remember vaguely that you did have a problem. One particular faculty yeah. member was just totally unbelievable. This guy was nuts. Yeah. He said, uh, yeah, um, I got a call from a faculty member saying that you told a student to call him at home about a library book. I said, I, Mr. Brown, I have no idea what you're talking about. He said, well, the faculty member said that a student called him at home because the faculty member had a library book checked out, and that's, that's unacceptable. I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I didn't talk to any, I didn't work this weekend, I, I didn't tell any student to do anything like that. So he said, well, let me, I'll try to, I'll try to get more information. So I was so pissed. I went down and just wrote my resignation. No. I, I wrote it, I typed up and you know, I'm like. Now, did you have the Justice Department no, in I had your pocket or no. you had to scamper around fine I, I had nothing. I had I no, I just was so, because I had done a really good job. I yeah. built a department. I, was, it was, I knew I was doing well. 
on the stoop. Really well, it sounds that. like you sort of got set up by happenstance. I'll bet some kid leaked the information. Well, you know, what happened? What happened was I wrote my resignation. I gave it to him. No, I, I, I gave myself time. I gave myself. I remember giving myself three months to find another job. And I so I also wanted to be symbolic. So I dated my resignation for President's Day. Uh, since it's George Washington's birthday in February, so I gave myself three months in President's Day. Mm -hmm. So I give it to, to him, and I and I, I, I give it to the cop, to the dean, and the dean, and then I get a call from the dean within hours. Oh, no, 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 this must be a mistake. Uh, please don't resign. I said, no, that, that, I'm done. Mm -hmm. um, so what happened was apparently during the weekend, some student had gone to the circulation desk at the library. Yeah. And they asked about a book, people using books in those days. Asked about a book, and, and uh, the student at the desk went and looked and said, Well, the book is checked out. Because you know, I had those cards there, right? So, yeah, yeah, in those <coughs> days, everything was done yeah. with paper and yeah. cards and you know, accessible to, to probably anybody to peek. And, 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 I, and I don't know if the student told a student who was working the desk, I don't know if he told the kid who came to the desk looking for the book that Professor So-and-so had the book, or whether the student just looked at the card and saw that Professor So-and-so had it. But in any event, the student who was looking for the book ended up finding the professor's phone number, and on his own, he called the professor up. Uh -huh. So the fact that I was blamed for something I did, I just said, screw it, I'm done. Yeah. Within a week, Actually, I think it was maybe within like two or three days I got a call from Maureen Moore. Uh -huh. She says, Jim, I understand you're leaving GW. I said, Maureen's been like a couple of days. How do you know this? <laughs> and, you know, well Maureen's, connected then. Maureen says, I have my ways. She said, can we go have lunch? So I uh, went to lunch with her a couple of days later and uh, she Right there, she offered me a job going to GW as the head of the uh, to, to to justice as the head of the civil division library. Uh -huh. So another story, you know, some thing falls apart, and then you know uh, you get served a better dish. So yeah. I, I went to DOJ, which was a really good job for a little more than three years, and um, got a big pay raise. Well, that's always nice. Yeah. 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 So I ended up going to going to the government as well. But my goal is always to get back to academia, and I did a few years later. Yeah. Before we get back, I, I know this was not in our original uh, script of what we talk about, so if it trips you up, I'll take all this out. Okay. Uh, there was an assistant to Hugh Bernard. Uh, I'm trying to think of his name. Bidwell. Bob Bidwell. Bob Bidwell. He yeah. was an interesting guy. He was quite a character. I yeah. used to have deals with him on the side. And, I remember one day they were had bought some microfiche, which was coming in in those days to the libraries, and some <laughs> user, I'd say some kid, because that's how I put it to me, um, had used uh, the microfiche when he had peanut butter on his hands, oh. probably from a sandwich or something, and gotten it on the on the microfiche, and he asked me, Bob, did I have any idea how you get the peanut butter off the microfiche? And I thought, and I remember when I was a kid, I had did photography, the old-fashioned wet kind, you know, chemicals. Mm -hmm. And we just, you know, washed the film and dried it out. And I said, well, why don't you try that? Just did a little light soap, uh, nothing with, besides soap in it, you don't want hand cream or anything in it, and see if it picks, gets the peanut butter off, lay the thing flat, maybe under a little weight, let it dry out uh, the, the fish and see what happened. And apparently it worked. It worked. Yeah. The plan B was it was all from a vendor and he could probably have arranged to replace those few fish that way, but uh, this seemed to work. So. Yeah, Bidwell was a, he was an older guy, he was a character, he was a, really had a sparkle in his eye. Yeah, he's a, he, I really enjoyed him. Now your boss, uh, Bernard, I'll tell a story, because part of what we're doing is expanding our repertoire of information mm -hmm. about our profession. Uh, Hugh had a, uh, a rule, which I think had been dictated by the uh, faculty and dean, to keep students from other law schools basically out of the out of the law school because the building was tight and the yes, students wanted, for some reason, they were, thought they were paying for the use of a library they could fit into. And, uh, but one day, uh, somebody, the dean it was, I think, needed a book, and the copy at GW was off the shelf. Hugh called me up in a total panic. 
did we have it by any chance? And because this was before we could check each other's catalogs mm -hmm. in any way, except physically coming out, and he wasn't going to do that, I'm sure. So I checked. We, we we did own the book. I went and found it on the shelf. It was on the shelf. I got it to my office and. Uh, I said, well, I can send it down there by cab. Oh, was he so pleased, because uh, he had the book then for the dean within a couple hours. And from then on, if I needed a favor, he, went to he remembered to that, that and, and he'd give it to us. And that, was, that was a nice way of sort of enhancing the relationship. <laughs> yeah, no, I've got a great Mr. Bernard story. So this was probably been about two years. And as you know, what, what typically what everybody did, Every library, we knew that faculty members would take books without checking them out. Oh, you had that problem too. Huh? So, so you do a faculty inventory, right? You'd send, you'd, you know, you type out a message and you'd send it to every faculty member, to yeah. every faculty saying we're, usually you do it after classes ended in early May, mid-May or something like sure. that. Sure. Right? We're doing a faculty inventory, so we're going to be in your office on blah, 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 blah. If you, do, if you want to be there while we're doing this, let us know, so we'll time it so you can be there, you know, while we inspect your office. So that had gone fine for the first year with no problems. It must have happened after the second summer. And uh, Mr. Bernard, my office, I didn't have an office, but my area was next to the circulation desk on the third floor of the library, which is sort of the main floor, I think. Mm -hmm. um, the librarians and everything. And Mr. Bernard's, you know, GW is a vertical building. And he was up on the seventh floor yeah. by himself and his secretary. And there was a lounge there, which is, you know, we had coffee time. So oftentimes you go up there at 3 o'clock or 3 time was for, for a cup of coffee. So I was up there one afternoon for a cup of coffee and I hear this commotion in Mr. Bernard's office which is around the corner mm -hmm. screaming. Oh. And I walk down the hall on the returning left and there's Professor but The one you mentioned earlier yeah, was yeah. sort of problematic. The wild man. Yeah. The wild man. So um I look in there and he says to Mr. Bernard, and I five, probably weighed about 200 pounds. He was just a rock, just right? Just a big, just a bulky guy. Big huh? guy who was, I think, from Alabama or Mississippi or something. How would you like if someone did this to your office? And he takes his arm on Mr. Bernard's desk. Mr. Bernard was about 5'6 and probably weighed about 110 pounds. Remember how slight he was? I remember. Small guy. He takes his arm and wipes clear of Mr. Bernard's desk. Just sweeps everything off. Sweeps off everything floor. off his desk, is you know. And I come in the door. I said, "What's going on?" <laughs> so I said, who are you? And I said, "I'm you know." I said who I was. Are you the one who's responsible for someone coming into my office? I said, "What do you mean?" There was a student in my office looking at my books. Your our books, basically. And I said, "Well, yes, I am," and he starts coming after me, you know. And Mr. Bernard <coughs> ran up behind, Mr. Bernard's a little slight guy, he runs up behind, puts him in like some kind of reverse head hammerlock. <laughs> Turns out Mr. Bernard, who's this tiny little guy, was a judo expert. Oh. So he actually takes this crazy man, who outweighed him by about 70 pounds, and I move out of the way, and he basically escorts him out of the library suite, and he's leaving, he's screaming, I've got a gun in my office, and I'll use it if I have to. It's screaming at me. Oh, well, <coughs> yeah. that, that would be... GW was then very scary. GW think, was you know. an interesting place. So, uh, <clears throat> so after that, Mr. <laughs> Bernard said, oh, don't worry about him. He's just he's an emotional guy. So I said, he wasn't well, shooting at <laughs> Pearl Hill. He was yeah. threatening so to let this pass. I gotta don't talk. worry about it, Jim. I'm going to talk to the dean. I'm going to mention this to the dean. So I went, oh, don't, that's just... Don't worry about it. I said, no. So I went and talked to the dean on the dean. I said, oh, don't, don't worry about it. You know, there's no, there's, don't worry about it. So I said, this is crazy. No one wants to, you know, confront this, this lunatic. Mm -hmm. Especially if he has a gun. <laughs> so I went to campus police. And they searched the guy's office. And he did have a gun at his desk. Uh-huh. So the law school still at the desk. And was there anything I could, you know, this guy who's threatened me. Is there anything we can do? And the GW said, I'm sure they said something like, well, there's something that a faculty member can do, take action against a faculty member. A student can take action against a faculty member, but a staff member, who I was, or what I was, 
had no recourse against a faculty member. So that was the end of that, and of course six months later or so I left for a mm -hmm. different reason. About two years later I was at Justice and I get a call from uh, Vice Dean Potts, Ed Potts, who was one of the deans there, who also was one that just shifts things under the table. Hi Jim, like he's my best friend. <laughs> this is Ed Potts, remember me from GW? Oh, yeah, hi Dean Potts, how you doing? Oh, just fine, blah, 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 blah. He says, Jim, do you remember a couple of years ago when Professor Hay threatened you? with a gun. <laughs> I said, yeah, I remember that. And then you say to myself, well, you know, well, would you be willing to testify what he did um, at that time? I said, what's going on? He said, well, I can't give you the detail. Let's just say we're going to be having a hearing or something like that going on here. So obviously he must have threatened Potts, right? Mm -hmm. and they wanted or somebody. somebody. Or somebody there. <clears throat> So I said, for sure, just let me know when he said, it will probably be in a couple of weeks. And a couple of weeks passed or something like that, and I contacted Potts and said, you still need me? I haven't heard back from you. He said, oh, well, the problem solved. So GW was an interesting place to work. It was a great job. We built the staff up, and then I left for Justice. <laughs> yeah. Well, I imagine Justice was a tad bit uh, tamer in some ways. Oh, yeah. Justice. Tell us a little bit about that opportunity. Yeah, well, Marine hired uh, yeah. Marine Moore. Yeah, working with Marine was great. She hired me because civil division logger had sort of been neglected for a couple of years. Um, it was the kind of place you, when I got there, I looked at the USCAs on the, on the shelves. The civil division had 300 attorneys in several different units um, um. commercial litigation and torts and admiralty and things like that, aviation, um, uh, 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 federal programs. And these great attorneys, right? They're just the bit really shot, hard shot attorneys. And, you know, the first thing I do is look at the collection and I look at the USCAs and the pocket parts were two or three years old. Oh. So that's interesting. And here is our Department of Justice, they're lying on all yeah. law. And, you know, you look at the Federal Registers and it stopped two years earlier. And I mentioned that there was an assistant, one of the guys that was named Charles. I said, Charles, do you know what's going on with? The fact that things haven't been updated in at least two years, maybe three. He said, uh, I'll show you. And he comes into my office, I had a real nice big office there, and there was a door over there. And he said, you got a key to this closet? And so this is like my first day there, I think, first or second day. Yeah. And I said, well, let me try this. So he said, uh, I said yeah, it looks like it's working. He said, be careful how you open it. And I open the door to the closet, I pull it out, and there's... From floor to ceiling, there are federal registers and supplements to books and oh. supplements to USCA and stuff like this. Oh, so now, the attorneys <coughs> were using the outdated stuff, so basically, our, you know, we got the place together. And, uh, and Maureen was, she'd give you what you needed and she left you alone. Yeah, so, sounds like she'd left somebody a little too alone uh, who was supposed to file the supplements or see that it got done. Yeah, well, I, won't, I won't mention the name of the person who was moved to a different part of the the DOJ library system. No, that's, uh, so I was there for three, just about three and a half years, and then um, just short of three and a half years, and I went to Idaho. That's right, you headed out west, out sort of in the way out west. Idaho was pretty close to the Pacific coast, just a little bit in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you were uh, at the uh, University of Idaho was director of the law library for about five years, I think. Yeah, I went there in 83 and, and then came out here at uh, um, when married in 88. So uh, that was another good job. I followed. Uh, like you said, you wanted to get back into the academic end of our profession. Yeah. Now here you are. You and you know, I, had, I had some other interviews and, and none of them worked out. And as a turn, you know, you think you're rejected or something, or you don't like them, whatever. And, and then you end up with the job that's the good one. Yeah, and Idaho was it was a real good, real good place to be. And Moscow was a fun city, a nice little town. And um, Janet, who was my wife, who I met at GW, uh, GW, she was an intern there, and then she worked at the U.S. Court of Claims and Court of Customs Appeals with uh, Luella Ingram. Mm -hmm. No, one of our yeah. colleagues. And Janet became the assistant librarian there. Um, I remember she applied for the job. She didn't have a library degree and she applied for the job. And I said, Janet, you're not going to get a job there. You, they say you have to have a library degree. Mm -hmm. 
So she interviewed and she got the job <laughs> on the condition that she go to library school. So she went to Catholic and then yeah. good place and close by. Yeah, and then she worked there for a little while and then she went to Jenna worked at uh, Kirkland Ellis. Uh -huh. She went to the law firm law side. Firm. There's a library in there for a little while in DC. Then she went to their Chicago office. And then in 85, she came out to Moscow. We got married out there. Mm -hmm. And then um, she's from Connecticut. Her sister now, with then, lived and still does in South Carolina. My family was from Detroit. My mother, I think she had moved to Florida already. So Williamsburg seemed like a. Your mother got tired of the cold weather in the winter. Yeah. Huh? yeah. Williamsburg seemed like a good place. We'd sort of be right in the middle of everything. And also, when Mary's was, was a good law school. Yeah. So, so then you came here to Virginia, and, uh, and you've been here ever since. Yeah, I never thought I'd be here 28 years or whatever it is. If no. I had, if I, if no, I knew I that, you're I would. probably the only one that's gone to a place thinking, well, this will be another way station, and then you settle in and complete your career there. I did it in America. Yeah. Same kind of thing. I wish I, I should, I would, if I knew that, I would have taken the, the, joined the Virginia retirement system, which I didn't, but. Uh -huh. That's okay. Oh well. <laughs> that's right. Now that you're getting towards the end of your career, yeah. in that sense, uh, that suddenly takes a higher prominence than perhaps it did at one time. Yeah. So this has been a really good job too, mm -hmm. being able to build the place up and uh, have a new building and everything. Yeah. yeah. Well, you've showed me around before we did this uh, conversation today, and I had been here a few years back visiting, and you've added a lot to the library. You showed me the new section and redone the whole thing, and just the uh, probably the last decade or so, or thereabouts. Yeah, 2007, 2005 to 7, 2007 was construction. Shelley Dowling, who was supposed to be with us today, but uh, yeah. um, you'll interview her another time. Shelley, you know, had been the Supreme Court library. We all knew her yeah. from D.C. Yeah, in D.C. And she and her husband retired down here probably around maybe 10 years ago, 10, 11, 12 years ago. Uh -huh. And Shelley inquired about working part-time so basically she worked a bit as a reference librarian for us and then she was uh during the renovation and the whole process she was my right hand person because she shelly knows what she's doing she's got good taste she coordinated all the have an and everything. expert of that caliber yeah. come along and say gee i wouldn't Falls mind right a little gig while i'm retired <laughs> you're right your lap. so so uh, she worked on the project um uh diligently and then I think maybe for another year she worked as a part-time reference librarian um, so that, that was good fortune as well good. and the, the main thing you know we, we, we were able to build a really really good staff here and provide to, they're all superb people smart people service oriented so that's that's, that's what you you know that's what a lot of that's what you really. want I mean the idea is you want people to leave go out the door happy and not mad at you and the world and right. whatever. Yeah, you do want good people. Um, well, Jim, you <coughs> had a very varied career, but you've also varied in other ways. You've had a, a major role in the uh, profession more broadly, um, and perhaps even here at the campus. Is there any things about that that you'd like to share with us? Oh. Um... Well, in terms of the, the, the university, I have been involved in different things, but I also, uh, Chris Byrne and I, who's our head of research and instructional services, mm -hmm. he and I co-teach um, a long public policy course. We've done that for 14, 15 years now. So actually, I'm on the faculty of the public policy uh, um, program as well. So that's been fun. That's, uh, we usually have about 20 students, master's degree students, so we teach that course every year. Uh, so we have six people who co-teach a um, law literature course, mm -hmm. five of whom are library staff members, five of whom are librarians, so we do that every spring. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's six of us who also teach um, in the legal practice, it used to be the legal skills program, where we teach the research component of it. So we're pretty active in the um, uh, pedagogical part of the I'm college. hearing more and more about that as I do these conversations and otherwise have chats uh, that aren't on camera, should we say, with colleagues, that librarians are much more involved in the teaching role of law schools now than they were even a few years ago when I was still active. Yeah, it's, it's fine. And with the, the one thing I stayed away from 
was technology. I remember about 20 years ago, probably starting maybe the mid early 90s, late 80s. Mm -hmm. Remember all the librarians who you know they ended up taking over the technology I part remember, of the law school. Yeah, and, and I remember having a discussion with Dick Danner, who was one that did have that view and has been successful in that way. Yeah, I knew if I did that, I'd be unsuccessful. That, I don't. That, you know, this wasn't my field, and, and what I didn't say and didn't dare say it publicly at the time was the law school had been sort of notorious for underfunding technology at a time when it needed a lot of resources. And then the poor person in charge kind of oh. uh, having to scramble around and uh, usually ended up leaving at some point. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of the stuff what you deal with, you what you dealt with, and, and still, but especially in those days, were problems, right? Exactly. You know, it's like it's what you didn't do for me, not all the things you did for me yeah. that got the credit. It's, yeah, it's like, like 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 fixing the photocopy or fixing the uh, you know the the, yeah. the pencil sharpener doesn't work and then they can't. You know, it's not printing. I can't. Do this. <laughs> I just had never any desire, nor nor the ability to mm -hmm. to be in charge of that part of the shop. That sounds like a strategic decision, of probably the right sort. Yeah, I'm sure it was. I mean, a lot of others allowed me to do different things, like even at the professional association stuff and you know, scholarship and teaching. Well, I know our big bugaboo with the. Uh, in our library for many years was a great big heavy duty state portland it was needed this is still when everything was in paper and for some reason those would break quite regularly so we ended up they were expensive like 70 bucks each and this was a manual state portland oh, yeah. we still had throw a whole bunch of papers and those would break all the time so we had to buy a bunch of them and stockpile them in the storeroom and so we'd bring one out real quick when one broke and then keep keep the inventory up. Used to go through a couple a year, that's right. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what exactly what happened, I, but why well, that thing would you, break. I wonder if they, they, the students like put it on the floor and, you know, step on it or something. Never saw what they did, but yeah, those were heavy things. things. Were regular regular things yeah. They break. Yeah. And we got the biggest, brawniest one we could find. Uh, so we were buying, but yeah. it didn't seem to work. Well, Let's move now off campus into the broader profession. Uh, I've already mentioned that you are a past president of AELL, but uh, not only that, you've been involved in broader parts of the association and um, and in other organizations. You want to talk a little bit about some of that? Well, I guess the, the, the library stuff it, association started with that. I was president of AEL, Virginia Association. I was president of CO. Mm -hmm. Then I had the good fortune of losing an election to uh, to be on the executive board for WLL, mm -hmm. um, and then it, and, and notwithstanding that, I was elected to be president. So that was good. So I served three years instead of having to serve. Most people have to serve <laughs> six. So three years was was so a good. You number. came in without the experience of being yeah, a, it's probably it's, a refreshing uh, president. It's almost every job I have. Where it's like, oh, well, how do you figure this out? What are you supposed to do and screw up? Um, but that was, that was enjoyable. Now, early before that, um, I think, as you know, Carol Billings had the, um, was the president for the 95, or the 1995 meeting in Pittsburgh? Yeah, a year before mine. I think I was 96. Yeah, 95. Uh, and and it was I, in Pittsburgh, and you had the very interesting, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the focus of the program that was so unique at that point. In yeah, that. Carol, of course, is very creative, and she's a she is. she's a very good friend of mine now. Um, and I'd moved; I didn't even know her before I came here. Um, in fact, I remember when I was still in Idaho, Wes Cochran, who mm -hmm. was was from from the Northwest. Yeah, Washington, and then later went to uh, Lubbock, Texas. He went to Lubbock. I remember. I remember Wes calling me up and said. Um, it was the president's election for Double Dill for, for Margaret Leary versus Carol Billings. And Wes was a good, knew Carol quite well. And he said, uh, Are you going to vote for the election? I said, Well, I don't know, probably Margaret Leary because I know her a bit and she's an academic. And Carol was at the Wall Library of Louisiana. And Wes was trying to convince me to vote for Carol for president. And I ended up voting for Margaret Leary because I knew Margaret and know Carol. So yeah. I ended up coming here and sure. I became very close friends. And she asked me to be the education. Um, uh, the, the program uh, chair for the Pittsburgh Radio is Carol's idea to have a national conference on legal information issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and the idea was to bring in, you know, most AAAO programs are done by people in our profession. 
and Carol was very involved in information policy issues, mm -hmm. mutual citations and things like that, and other things as well, the consolidation of the publishing industry. And, uh, and her idea was to bring in all sorts of people from the government, from uh, law firms, from law schools, professors, deans, government policy people, associations, and have a, um, I guess you call it a conference within a conference, but it was really, the, the conference really, the annual meeting really was the National Conference of Legal Information Issues. So that was a lot of, uh, it was very creative and a lot of fun, and, and, and I got to do that. And then when I was president in 99, mm -hmm. I wanted to do the same, pretty much the same yeah, thing. Remember you did a follow-up in, uh, in D.C. Yeah, yeah. Well received, and in a place where people would be there. It was a logical place. I mean, it was, a, yeah. it was I think, quite by far the... I know at the time it was it had the most programs of any annual meeting, and I think they were good too. It, uh, Tim Coggins, who was a very good friend, was the program chair for that meeting. I mm -hmm. asked him to do that, and um, we had I think between everybody at that meeting there were more than three thousand people there, so it was a really well attended meeting. Mm -hmm. And I got I remember getting flack from they had just the association had just started this AMSC annual meeting program selection committee. And those folks were really giving me a hard time. They didn't want to have another national conference. So I didn't call it a national conference. You know, I think my head, my um, my theme was at the crossroads, which has a blues theme off. That's Robert Johnson at the crossroads, crossroads blues. Yeah. So um, because we're at the crossroads of all sorts of stuff, information policy, information technology, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. So that was my theme, but basically it was a National Conference in Legal Information without calling it that, because we did the same kind of thing. We had uh, chapters were encouraged to bring in a people from the outside, and we had a lot of information policy people there. So it was a, it was a fun meeting. Yeah. It was exciting. Well, there's always a certain amount of resistance uh, uh, to any ideas, some of it well placed, some of it perhaps oh, yeah. just resistance because it's different. Uh, well, yeah, I was the. Um, before I left, well, before I left uh, Westpac, when I was still in Idaho, I was the program chair for the, I guess it must have been the, I can't remember, it must have been the 88 Westpac meeting. So I started doing that before I came here, and then I changed jobs. So I was still working on that program. I wanted to have an entire program on Western legal history. Uh -huh. Because I thought that was cool, right? Sure. Because usually the programs are, you know, they're sort of predictable and the same kind of stuff all yeah. over again. You know, here's Sounds how we, like you wanted to give people something a little different. I want to do something different. So the entire program was on Western legal history. So I actually finished you know, working on that program here, and then I flew back out to, I think it was in Spokane, where the conference was, and we had the program there. And I remember I had, you know, a guy named Wilkinson, who was very big in Indian law from Colorado, mm -hmm. and Nancy Carroll Carter, who had written something on the Bancroft Whitney Company, came up from Golden Gate, and other people just, the whole program was on Western legal history, and people thought, how can you do that? You know, that's, you know, that's not what we do, that does nothing to do with our jobs. And I said, you're in the West. <laughs> Western legal history has everything to do with, with what lawyers do, because everything is natural resources, and, you know, whether it's mining, and trees, and lumber, and water, Indian rights, and uh, so mm -hmm. I sort of did it because I wanted to do it, and, mm -hmm. and it worked. I thought it worked well. I had a good time. It's all like... <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. I followed the same kind of footsteps at a prior, an earlier meeting that he did, is, and I didn't get the transition, hadn't started to change into a, a more of an advisory committee instead of a more decision-making committee on programming. And we put on a program that had been proposed by, you know, a very broad group of members. But there were at least a few who uh, let me know that they were very disappointed because of something or other in the program. And, you know, you're trying to accomplish a variety of things. You want people that need, you know, help in learning the ropes of their new jobs, uh, practically. Uh, give them some programs about that. Uh, but also you have colleagues who need to get continuing legal ed credits for their bar association and you want to have a few things that qualify and then, you know, a few fun things too. Yeah, I've never had a problem with that. I sort of put myself on the limit. When the DC meeting, I also had the paraprofessional forum. Mm -hmm. We had an entire day for, um, 
for non-professionals, which no one had ever done in an meeting before. It hasn't been done since. Mm -hmm. And we had, I, I can't remember, we had quite sure we had more than 100 bear professionals there, and it was good. Bring them to our meeting, too, and we did. Yeah, so, and, uh, you know, a service to our members who have these people reporting to them, that probably found it very helpful to have this availability of, of a program that met their needs. Yeah, so I try to do things. Some, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. You know, if you don't piss off some people, you aren't doing a very good job, I guess. Oh, I like to hear that, because <laughs> I did on occasion over the years. Now, there was one other aspect that you were involved in. Carol was certainly involved in it. I, by circumstance, was as well. And that was beginning the programs, the joint programs, with uh, the British and Irish Association of Law Librarians, Canadian Association, and, and AALL. Uh, and I remember all three of us were in England uh, at one point working with BIO on setting up the first of these right. programs and the concept, getting it launched. Uh, and again, that was, a, that was a Carol Billings idea, yeah. right? But it's one that you had a, you know, some of the heavy lifting, I think, she had you do as well. Yeah, I played a, played a little in for the, for the, I think, for the first one that we had. And after yeah. that, there were other people who were involved. Um, but yeah, it's that's one thing nice. One thing you can do uh, in our associations um, is, and in our professions, get things done. You know, mm -hmm. we're a hell of a lot better than the Congress in doing that kind of stuff. Is you know, if you um, that's what's nice being a director, right? You, you want to do Order something. Order it done. And you yeah. Get it done. Well, maybe as an elected leader, you don't quite have that clout. No, but well, I think one of the big accomplishments, at least I thought I had at the time for AA Double was what won the meeting to the uh, and um, we opened up our membership. Mm -hmm. um, it was probably the most fun. You know, usually business meetings at Double Double are horrible bores. Where nothing <laughs> happens. Well, I don't know. If we should admit that. Oh, gosh. They are a little monotonous because yeah. there's a lot of stuff that has to be done. Just because that's the form. But uh, remember, among the board, it was um, how do we broaden our membership? And and I remember coming home from a, um, I think I must have been vice, I don't remember if I was vice president, but I guess I was president at the time. And it was a few months before the meeting, maybe maybe about six, about seven months before the meeting. And it looked like the whole thing had collapsed. And on the way home, I just thought, well, there's got to, there's got to be common ground we can come to, right? So you think of the the sandbox, mm -hmm. who gets to play in the sandbox, and how big is the sandbox, and who's outside the sandbox, uh -huh. and then you have to figure out if you're talking about expanding the membership, because everybody's worrying about are the publishers going to take over our association? Yeah, are they going to be the, are they, are yeah. they going to be uh, can they be on the board? Can they be chairs of committees and blah blah blah? Yeah. So I just laid out something. I said, here's my view of it. I remember sending them email message off to the other board members and saying, how about this? And I think that I thought, well, maybe that'll work. So that's what we did. And then that because we're changing the bylaws, it had to come up at the end at the, the, uh, the business meeting. And that was a big business. But, you know, I remember people getting upset and getting in line to speak and stuff. themed about something, come in more readily. Oh, yeah. Those that are benign about it. Yeah. So that, that was fun. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Well, you know, we're, the association, of course, is going through a version of this now in that it's uh, just recently we had a referendum on uh, whether to change the, uh, the name uh, and refocus the, uh, I guess it's the branding of law librarians. Yeah, I'm it, it, it didn't pass, but the concept may well reoccur. Who knows? Uh, yeah. In the course of the period, there might be some rethinking. Yeah, I was one of the people who voted against the name change association for legal information. I, I find nothing bad and nothing good. Well, you had 82 yeah, or 83 percent of your fellow yeah, members were in agreement. It's like, yeah. what's wrong with libraries? You know? Yeah. And uh, actually, frankly, I, I, I thought it was going to pass because I, I thought most, if not almost, all of the firm people would vote for it. Yeah, they and didn't. They didn't. They didn't. Because uh, I thought because that's where the major shift in focus would be most appropriate. Right. Um, although I saw the merits of the other, I, I said I could support it. Uh, I told the president, uh, Keith uh, Stiverson, that I would, I would support it, but 
I was in the minority. So you were on the 20% side. I was on the less than 20%, uh, the real minority from the group, yeah. But I wasn't wild about the name they changed, that they selected, but, you know, I figured, well, I'm not on the board, I'm not in the leadership, leave that to those people. Uh, mm -hmm. So maybe. It's possible that part of the reason was the name they picked. Okay. It could well have been, uh, especially from the private law sector, where uh -huh. information, providing information is their real focus and how they need to be perceived in their firms from what many of the uh, our colleagues there have told me. Um, if they're perceived as librarians, they're, you know, seen as older, antiquated uh, fixtures, and as times get tight, yeah. you don't want to be so perceived. It's yeah, like it, worked, it worked fine for people like Jack Ellenberger and... Yeah. Uh, but that was a different era. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we won't have rehash the mode it has been decided for now. I mean, you and I were in D.C. and we all knew how amazing the, the firm librarians were in were Carolyn Ahern and all oh, those yeah. people. Oh, yeah. Stellar and, people. And, uh, and the business people, the core people like Cammie Hedges and yeah. uh, who were just And even many of the government librarians, I mean, they, as the government cut back on supporting this sort of thing, they started vanished a bit from the scene, but uh, people like Oscar Struthers that was the leader, uh, Marlene McGurl of the oh, Library of Congress, I mean they were major figures uh, yeah. in that era uh, in our profession, yeah. in, in the right sense of that term. Um, well, we've sort of hashed and rehashed and whatever uh, your outside involvement, but you're also, we've done some publication. You want to uh, talk a little bit about any of that? Well, I guess I started out in copyright, and, and copyright was, was pretty much where I focus on other, other things as well. But yeah, it's this is another happenstance thing. I don't even know how I got on the copyright committee, uh, but it happened when uh, maybe uh, GW, maybe Justice, I can't remember. But I remember I wrote in, there was a, um, a King Research Study, remember that? Mm -hmm. by, uh, the, the, about Section 108 of the Copyright Act. It was yes. Supposed, the Copyright Act of 1976 had a, within the Act, they had to do a study mm -hmm. of the effect of, I think, Section 108 was the library exemption. Yeah, sort of the fair use thing. Exactly. Well, or it, it was fair use way, but it was, it was, you know, 108 is the library exemption that applies. It really is fair use for libraries, right? Yeah. The library staff members. Sort of equivalent. Protects them. Of yeah. Someone fudges the rules that and that was, using their stuff. Mm, no, because of the rights, because of the rights. Yeah. And so they, there was a, a, a they hired a company called King Research and they did a study, they did a report, and I wrote it, I don't even know why. I, I, as a member of the committee, I think I was asked, or maybe volunteer, I can remember, to write something about the study. So I did it, and I remember getting a call from, um, was Roger, was, I believe it was Roger Jacobs. Jim, I read your report. It's really good. Why don't you see if you can get it published? Get it published? He said, yeah, why don't you send it to the Law Library Journal and see if they're interested in publishing your, your, your report. Mm -hmm. well, oh, why not? So I sent it to AAL and they published it, and that's sort of how I got into copyright. So I ended up... Um, <laughs> so you became the expert, sort of. Uh, well, Lolly Galley, Gassaway, and Sally Wine were probably more of the experts than me. But, well, they were uh, also experts, I'll give them yeah. that. Uh, so, yeah. I, three of you. Know, <laughs> yeah, I guess three of us for a while. And you know, Sally and I ended up writing, a, co authoring a copyright handbook. Mm -hmm. Then, I don't know, a few years after that, I wrote a book on my own, The Librarian's Copyright Companion. And then, about maybe three or four years ago, I figured it was time for a second edition, so I asked two people who we're here, um, Paul Helger, who's still on our, our staff, and Ben Keel, who was on our staff then, who's since left, to co-author it. So we did the, the second edition of that together, mm -hmm. and, and some articles here and there. Yeah, writing's fun. Yeah. yeah. Well, there are people that don't do it or maybe haven't had the experience, they're often a little intimidated by the prospect, uh, from what yeah. I'm hearing from many. But uh, as you say, if it's your thing, why not share? And know, if you have time, you know, know. And it's and time is also a factor, sure. And a number of members of our staff here have, you know, 
written different things. So you try to encourage people to do it, and um, uh, it's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, speaking of different things, that's sort of the last thing on my list I'm ticking off as we go along. Um, you know, getting back to the very beginning when we talked about the fact that you have a little summer gig coming up uh, in uh, Spain. Uh, do you want to share anything more about that? Oh, well, when I, I guess it was 2000, yeah, about 15 years ago, I, I, uh, Winmary's had this summer program in Spain for I think 29 years now, and, and every year there's a, uh, an administrator, and I was the administrator of the program 15 or so years ago, um, and um, the program is since, this is, this is going on in every law school. Yeah. We used to, when I, when I was there, we had more than 100, I think about 120 students in the program, including Spanish students. Mm -hmm. And this year, there have been 100 American law students from different schools, including ours. And this past year, it's down to 24. Oh. But this is happening everywhere, because every, every law school is encouraging their students, saying, you got to work, you got to get some practical experience during yeah. the first summer. So it's affecting... But in any event... Um, <clears throat> The person who was was directing our program decided not to do it anymore. So I said to the dean, "Well, I'll do it. So we'll see what happens. You know, we're uh, um, we'll see if the program succeeds or not." Yeah, I suppose you're in a period where you have to reevaluate anything. I mean, it's times are tight. And yeah, hard, we really glad. we had um, you know uh, my administrative assistant Betty Labanish is is you know she's sort of become part of her job now. She's sort of doing the nuts and bolts of the program. So we saved a law school. They used to have uh, people, hired people to do the program. So we're doing it internally now, so saving them money. And I just cut, we used to have nine courses for 100 people. And then we had nine courses for 24 people. So I just lopped off three of the lowest rated courses. Why not? Well, you got to. You can't yeah. keep, it's like, it's like if a law library has 4,000 subscription, print subscriptions, mm -hmm. in like we did, and let's say 2005, and by 2015 you've cut it by more than half, you don't have the same number of people in technical services processing stuff. If you have the same number of people there, what are they doing? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, you got to, as, as you know, you got to you know, make changes as, as, yeah. as technology changes, as things well, change. We've always had some changes all through our careers, but I guess from everything I'm told, including this mention, is that uh, the last few years, since my retirement actually, the uh, changes have been much more uh, rapid and yeah, we dramatic. Started, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we started, um, I started, you know, I'm not alone, well, there's people done more than me, but back in 2000 when I started systematically, I should say we, our staff here, Systematically looking at our print subscriptions uh -huh. um, because for two reasons: one, you're converting to electronic. You know, yes. you also have Lexus and Westlaw, but everything else is coming online, uh, with BNA and CCH online and things like mm -hmm. that. And also, your budgets couldn't su couldn't support those constant ten percent yeah. increases. Yeah, big increases. So you know, we've canceled I don't know sixteen or seventeen hundred or something like that print subscriptions in, in, since mm -hmm. two thousand and um, and. If you don't need, if you have the same stuff in electronic format, if the students don't look at the print anymore. Well, that's the old joke I keep hearing, is you have the kids sitting in front of a whole wall of books, a whole range of shelves, and looking at a screen in front of him and, or her, and if the, whatever it is the student needs isn't on that screen, they don't know it exists. That's right, and, and you know, we, for, for the last several years, we haven't, we don't teach any legal research involving print materials. Mm -hmm. It's all electronic. Mm -hmm. It used to be, right, you well, used to teach is. legal research, you used, used to talk yeah. about the print, say, oh, it's also in electronic format. Now it's the other assumption is that yeah. everything is electronic, maybe yeah. you have it in print as well. Maybe well, it you know. also influences the number of copies of certain basic things you would need to get just to support the print version of that course. Oh, I remember what... Georgetown used to have something like six or eight copies of the regional reporters and yep. things like that. And well, of course, they had a lot of students. And a lot of students, yeah, too. And more than 2,000 students, too. Yeah, they had a big volume count, but it wasn't a particularly broad collection in those days. It was focused on the nuts and bolts stuff. Yeah, thankfully, the uh, ABA has gotten rid of counting 
books and subscriptions and stuff like that. Yeah, now they want quality and access. And uh, how you measure that, I don't know. Well, you know we're, we'll be happy they used to do it, you had more volumes that had to be better, even if they were all lousy things like old editions of case books we used in class. And That's right. Some of our colleagues used to park on their shelves at one point. Oh yes, I've been in some libraries with, with real big collections and you think, what are you kind of spending your money on? And then the reference librarians are hidden away, you know, it's yeah. some other floor, you couldn't even see them. They're fine then. Well, times have hopefully changed away from some of that. Yeah, and, and you know, you're done, I'll be done in a few years, and uh, there'll be other people's it's issues. It's easier to hear about it after you're no longer <laughs> on your watch. <laughs> well, Jim, you know, we're probably coming towards the end of today's uh, conversation, but it's customary to ask if there's anything we have not talked about that uh, you would like to bring up. And mm -hmm. remember, not everybody has anything to bring up. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's been a, my son asked me, who, my younger son, because um, he's, he's, he's out of school, but he's going to be going back to school in some, for something, he does not sure what, he's trying to figure out what he wants, what he really wants to do, and he said, it's just a couple of weeks ago, uh, Seth sent me an email saying, um, so was there, was there anything you really wanted to do that you really would have changed and done something different? And I said, well, he said, what did, like, what did you want to be when you were a kid? I said, well, I was a kid, I wanted to be a Detroit Tiger, right? <laughs> oh, sure. But that wasn't going to happen. And I said, you know, frankly, um, no, you know, everything worked out. Sometimes, I did, you know, sometimes you, there's a crossroads that, you know, you, you go right or left, or sometimes, you, you know, the detours put up for you, like what happened at Berkeley with me, and I ended yep. up at GW, and then how I left GW, which ended up working well for Justice, and then being rejected from, you know, job interviews at other places, and you end up at Idaho, which turns out really well, and then you end up at <clears throat> William & Mary, so I said, no, I'm, I'm really happy with my profession, where I, I can't complain, I've, I've I think I've been pretty successful and I make a good living and I live in a nice place and got a good family and everything's worked out. Well, it's certainly, uh, I mean, this isn't the only time I've had occasion to come here to Williamsburg, uh, but it's a delightful uh, small t city and uh, rush hour, I don't know what it's like for you, but it is the same thing as I saw in New York City a couple of days ago, which was even a holiday and we're well, we live all over yeah. the streets. <laughs> well, I ride my bike to work usually, so it's it's, it's nine tenths of a mile. See, that's for the camera. If anybody wants to look for my job, you can live really close. Well, to when, when Jim decides <laughs> to retire, keep in mind this pitch and uh, make your application early. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's it's been a good place to live and a, and a good career. Good. Yeah. Well, maybe with all of that said, uh, uh, James Heller, I want to. Thank you for participating this morning in the, uh, this conversation. Uh, what you said is going to make an interesting and useful addition to the overall oral history because it basically fleshes out a lot about our profession and some of the people who uh, are not able to be interviewed these days for various reasons uh, who were part of it as well. Uh, your, your candid comments earlier on I thought were very appropriate and very interesting to hear. You worked with some interesting people over the years. It's been a, it's, it's been a good ride. Yeah. And thanks, Pat, for asking me. Well, in thanking you, I'm doing it, of course, not only on my own behalf, but on behalf of uh, Michelle Wu and Frank Hodak, our uh, librarian colleagues, and Dick Spinelli, uh, who was with the Hine Company for many years. He's a good friend of mine. Yeah. Uh, and since those three people, uh, I had the honor of uh, working to put together uh, this uh, history of our, of our professional life. Thank you. Well, thank you. Can I take my tie off now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there. Keep that in.